Yeah. Hello and welcome everyone to the Forum for Global Studies latest podcast. Here we invite prominent change makers and academic personalities of eminence to share their insights on the burning topics of relevance in the present times. I, Nandini Ghosh, a research fellow at the Center for Indo-Pacific Studies at Forum for Global Studies. We welcome you, sir, today on this session of the podcast and feel extremely happy and pleased to welcome you, Professor, in this session, featuring G20, a rising hope to inspire a more open and democratic UN. Friends, Professor Poge is an eminent voice in research areas of current geopolitics. He is the Lynchier Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs and founding director of the Global Justice Program at Yale University. He is also an eloquent speaker and a reputed author. Some of his great works include the Health Impact Fund, Making New Medicines Accessible for All, World Poverty and Human Rights, Realizing Roles, and many others. Friends, he is also a stout voice and for open and democratic United Nations. As we discuss today, I welcome you again, sir, on this podcast. Thank you. Yeah. To initiate the discussion, I would like to uh, initiate it by asking that it is as, as, in this approaching G20 summit and in this light of G20 summit, how do you visualize the post-1945 reality of UN and their arch of uh, improvement there? Sorry, can you repeat? I did not yeah. understand. Uh, yes, sir. I'm asking you that as we are going forward in the approaching G20 summit, in this light, how do you visualize the reformed UN's arch? And also, how do you visualize the uh, role of improvement in UN after 1945, as it represents the 1945, post-1945 era? Yeah, so... Uh... I think you're asking basically about uh, progress that has happened until now and progress that is to happen in the future. Yes, sir, please. Yes, okay. So I think that uh, the the progress uh, until now has not been very, uh, you know, a lot of progress. We have essentially stuck with the old structures of the UN And uh, there has been some improvement in some of the ways the UN works, but by and large, we are still working with the old system where the Security Council is dominated by the five permanent members, which have not changed over that period. And the General Assembly is uh, not having very much of an influence uh, through the, at the UN. So what we are proposing for the future is a UN that is more open in the sense that it represents not only governments, so it's not a a united governments of the world, so to speak, but a UN that represents, as the ambition originally was, the people of the world, the people and peoples of the world. And that means that there would be more voices articulated at the UN and more needs and interests that would be uh, said that the UN would be made sensitive to. That's our idea. And we want to achieve that goal in a way that is consistent with the existing UN rules and regulations. Basically asking the UN General Assembly to initiate the reforms that we are proposing. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your description of that. I would like to uh, go forward with this question that in this uh, G20 summit, and India is the president of it, and in India's presidency, how do you see India's role in taking forward the agenda of improvement through the multilateral order in UN? I think India is a crucial power in the world uh, for several reasons. India is the largest country of the global south, and it has in recent years uh, carved out for itself a leadership role in the global south. So, for example, there has been a lot of attention that was initiated by India to south-south collaboration. That is something that is surprisingly new. There was a little bit of it here and there, 
but by and large, there were a lot of relationships between southern countries and northern countries, but not enough of a relationship among the global south. And India has uh, tried to forge these relations, south-south relations, and has been quite successful with that, and has also done so in a way that uh, did not sort of overpower the other southern states, but try to bring them in at a, a context of equality. Of course, India is a larger, stronger state than most of the other states of the South, but India has, been, has tried to be open and fair also to the poorer and weaker states. So that yeah. has given India a lot of credibility in the global South. And so India has credibility as a spokesperson, so to speak, for the global South in trying to say that we are the large majority of the human population and we need to be more present at the United Nations and we have to be able to articulate our needs and interests and in general spearhead a movement to make the UN more democratic. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for this uh, elaboration of it. I, I would like to ask you another question in this regard, like uh, as we see the prolongation of the UN, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia war, the war has shown us one thing for sure, that is the cost of aggression, how it has uh, affected the uh, global humanity. So in that sense, I would like to ask that there is a first principle or goal for UN and that says that maintaining international peace and security. So how do you see UN's role in that, uh, uh, in that context and how do you see the failure of it, uh, it has been till date and how the experience tells us to? Yes, that is the crucial question. So thank you for that. And uh, I don't see the UN as a complete failure. I think we are better off than we might be. We have to remember that. Uh, we had horrendous wars in the first half of the 20th century, killing tens of millions of people. And yes, we still have lots of wars. And yes, we are still on the brink of war even in situations where we don't have an active war like India, Pakistan, for example, or China, Taiwan or something. But by and large, I think we have made some progress, but you are right, not enough. And it is sad, really sad to see that in the years, the last 200, 300 years that have seen so much progress in terms of science, in terms of administrative capabilities, in the terms of economic growth, in terms of technology. In all this time, we have not matured in terms of moral maturity to the point where we can finally leave behind violence as a means of settling differences. It's, it's disheartening. It's very sad, you know, that people, when they can't agree, start beating each other's faces in. And this is what's once again happening in Ukraine, but it's also happening, of course, in many other places that the media often ignore. Places like Yemen, for example, where you have a lot of violence and uh, world public opinion is simply not interested in what's happening there. Yeah. So violence is still there. And let me add one more thought to it. Uh, that is that, of course, Politics is largely understood by its practitioners as a competition for power. And in this competition for power, the practitioners have three sources of power, three means at their disposal. They have military strength, economic strength, and what's called soft power, the residual category of reputation, culture, morality. And here, of course, some countries are much stronger militarily than they are economically and in terms of soft power. And those countries always think that keeping the world at high tension and hostility 
is to their advantage because the more hostile the world is, the more important military power is as a source of political power. So this is something that we need to leave behind, but we also need to be aware that a world in which military power is sidelined will be a world in which some countries will be less powerful than they are now. And we need to convince or persuade these powers to agree to a transition that will be to their own disadvantage to some extent. Yeah, quite agreeing with you on the point that yes, United is not quite a failure, rather it has a lot of success in its credit. Uh, so seeing in the front of environmental uh, actions and the uh, lot of humanitarian activities that UN carries all throughout the world and reaches to the uh, peaceful uh, uh, solution in certain sections uh, at, at least, so how do you visualize that there is a uh, kind of tacit uh, contestation between two world leading powers that is the United States, which is quite acceptable in many countries and it's quite uh, uh, good in many senses and the rising ambitious China. How do you see that contestation is uh, becoming a hindrance in, in, in improvements there in the UN and in many activities that UN can carry in a very much potent manner than it, it, it is doing? Well, I see this as a danger. I, I think that we have dangerous and difficult times lying ahead because the United States is unwilling, of course, to share the leadership position with China. And uh, the Chinese are unwilling to accept a role as assistant or a second. And so there will be this conflict between the two superpowers. And that conflict is one in which the US has a crushing advantage in military strength. Economically, the two rivals are more or less at the same level. But militarily, the US has as much power as the rest of the world combined. And this obviously is a recipe for danger, because the US is going to want to use its military power in order to retain the top position. And that means that the US has to keep military power relevant, has to militarize international relations so that everyone understands that all things considered, the US is still number one. To put this in a different way, if military power or weapons lost their relevance tomorrow, let's say all weapons uh, are no longer functioning, then China would immediately become co-equal with the United States. So the US has a vested interest in keeping military power relevant. And the only way to do that is to maintain the world in a state of tension, hostility, and crisis. So that is what I predict for the coming years of contestation between the two superpowers. I predict that there will be a great deal of confrontation, tension, hostility, and uh, you know, dislocation as a result. Yeah, sir. Uh, Dr. Tripathi is willing to have an intervention here. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Poge, for your highly insightful you know, remarks on this, uh, uh, particular the U.S. position in the current global order. That you know mentioned that uh, uh, there is a vested interest uh, to make it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if the world is uh, hostile, and let it uh, continue to be hostile just because of the to maintain its hegemonic agenda. So, uh, do, uh, Professor Poge, just my one uh, no, uh, queries, it's not question, just queries, that, uh, that how do you think that uh, the international organizations such like a UNO, where the US has been anchor of this kind of you know, international organizations and uh, uh, the liberal philosophy says just because of this organization, there is a, there is a hope of uh, peace, there is a hope of you know, uh, you know, uh, somehow 
uh, a cooperation among the nations. Do you don't think so? Is, is it only rhetorics? Or in, in uh, do we believe, uh, should we believe that this liberal philosophy has no you know, relevance in today's world? So it is primarily rhetoric, but rhetoric has consequences. So uh, when uh, I spoke earlier of soft power, and so having the right rhetoric is a form of, of soft power, right? If the world sees you as a champion of democracy or as a champion of human rights or as a champion of the poor, that benefits you and gives you additional power. But it also constrains the way you act. If you talk a big deal about human rights, it's not so easy for you then to go into another country and uh, kill a lot of civilians. So, and the US has lost a lot of credibility with some of the wars that it has fought. So the Vietnam War, for example, which was raging when I grew up when I was a, a boy, uh, you know, it was incomprehensible how a country that pretends to be a champion of human rights can bomb a peasant population with superior technology, just bomb them into oblivion. So obviously uh, that was something that cost the United States a lot of credibility and weakened the United States. It was a ditto for some of the other wars that they've been fighting recently. So it is, uh, in a sense, rhetoric on the part of the hard-nosed uh, people in the State Department and the Defense Department. They see human rights as just one more instrument of policy, one more way to uh, gain and retain power. But it is something that has really a constraining influence on how states behave, simply because they also need to think about their soft power and need to think about their credibility. Taking forward the discussion, sir. Uh, as you were speaking about an unwilling China to accept the US hegemony, if I speak so, uh, I would like to ask you a question in this light of, the, of this context that, uh, there is a huge demand of improvement uh, in the UN or a reformed UN is the demand of the time, given the situation uh, all throughout, all across the world. So I would like to ask a specific question in this regard that a willing United States of America or a willing West gets some hindrances from an unwilling China given their stance in the Security Council for the improvement there in the uh, United Nations in the coming times? Uh, we have to explore that. We have to see what will happen there. So uh, there is a disconnect to some extent between the policies that are in the best interest of China and the policies that China is actually pursuing. And uh, I hope that more rational deliberation in China will prevail, not maybe in the next 10 years or so, but in the long run, where China will have a better understanding of its interests and in particular of the great importance of soft power. So China has, I think, not been paying enough attention to its soft power and has uh, really fraught its relationship with some important other countries, importantly India, of course, for no good reason. There was absolutely no reason to engage in these border skirmishes, right? Who is benefited by getting a few little extra square kilometers in some inaccessible mountain terrain? It uh, was pointless to antagonize people and to uh, damage the reputation that China may have had as a by and large peaceful country. So I think that uh, China could, be a country that would be happy to support reform and it would be in China's interest. China would not be sort of damaged by the kinds of reforms that I have in mind. But on the contrary, uh, China would, in addition to the great economic power that it already has, 
uh, especially with regard to the global south, it would also build goodwill and soft power by being a supporter of the kinds of reforms that we are advocating. Yeah, borrowing from your words that I would like to ask you, sir, a question that uh, China, as you're saying that China will not be, uh, not, will not be uh, a hindrance rather an acceptable partner on, on, on development side in the UN. I would like to ask you that, as you have said that uh, I have some reforms in my mind, how would you like to uh, elaborate that, sir? What are the reforms that you visualize in times to come? Yeah, so I think the, the key thing that we need to achieve is we need to build institutions that are not narrowly based on the power interests of states. I said at the very beginning of this conversation that the United Nations is really a united government now. It's governments that sit in the UN and governments, of course, they represent their country, but they don't fully represent their country. For one thing, there are many civil society organizations. There are people who voted for other parties or are not in full support of their government. And there are many interests that governments have in common, for example, the interest in preserving their own position in government that are not interests that they share with the population. So what I want to do is bring in more a more representative set of voices and interests from each country. And there comes the second point, this is not only so that more voices are heard and more interests are involved in decision making, but it is also so that decision making is more universally focused on what is good for humankind rather than merely on the interests of each state. In a united governments, Governments will all try to maximize their own power. They will be competing with each other and will jealously guard the international rulemaking to make sure that nobody else's interests are better served than our own interests. But what we really need is we need somebody to look after the common good, to look after justice in the world. And that easily falls by the wayside among power obsessed or national security obsessed governments. They don't think, you know, the US government will say, international relations is a jungle. We are competing with the Chinese. We cannot afford to be moral. We have to be single-mindedly focused on winning the competition. And of course, the Chinese think the same way and other governments think the same way. And so the interests of poor people, which is more than half the world's population, get ignored in such a context. So if we could widen the UN and if we could establish an ethos where those people who make decisions at the UN see themselves as representing the interests of humankind and not the interests only of their home country, then we could truly make progress towards a more moral world. Let me say as a last sentence, this revolutionary change of culture, of ethos, is one that we already experienced once before at the national level. So if you look at India today, when somebody is appointed minister in Delhi or prime minister in Delhi, we expect that person to forget the home state that they come from, Uttar Pradesh or Karnataka or Kerala, or whatever it may be. Now you are a minister in Delhi and you are supposed to represent the interests of all of India. If you are the health minister of India, you have to look after the health of all people in India, not just the ones in your home state, not just the ones in your hometown. And that same mindset 
is one that we need to establish also at the international level. We need to have decision makers at the international level who are focused on the common good, on humanity as a whole, in particular, the weakest and most vulnerable people who need support and protection the most, even if that sometimes goes at the expense of the interests of their home country. One intervention from Sir, please. Uh, a very interesting discussion, uh, Professor Poge, that, uh, and I think uh, the point you raised always grapples me personally. When I you know, go through, when I study uh, the liberal ethos that you mentioned here, uh, and a very, uh, no, very highly insightful example you stated here, that uh, like uh, if the any minister come from the any state, but at the national level, uh, that minister represents the nation. At the same time, uh, you know, for the you know body, those countries are the member, especially those who are very powerful P5 countries. They must represent as a, a global, as a global family, as a global governance. So I think this was it's very interesting that this was primarily it was during 1945. It was somehow you not know, dreamed, uh, and uh, and it was visualized that yes, the most powerful country will will uh, will take care of. Uh, you no, know, the order, the global order in terms of the cooperation and trade and everything. Um, but uh, on on practice, and and that that is the grappling point for me, especially when uh, I'm always dwelling between the realism and the idealism. You, you know, uh, you, you know, you pointed out all the pictures that is very gloomy pictures, and uh, of course, I think your suggestions will matter in diffusing the conflicts between Russia, Ukraine and other parts of the you know, other world. But is it how far, this, I just want to know how far, yeah, what are the mechanism, what are the methodology that we should come from the national mindset of we should come from the national security and we should come up uh, outside from the, like the nationalism and somehow the you know uh, a nation as entity and uh, international governance is just like a moralistic concept so this is the entire dilemma what do you think and what are the mechanism to come out from this kind of you know dilemma yeah uh, that's exactly the right question to ask and there are two points here right one is is a world of the kind that we want is such a world feasible and the answer is, of course, it's feasible. We have it already in nation states. We have it in India. We have it in the EU. So yes, it's feasible, but the difficulty is the transition. So what we have is a, a bunch of hyperventilating, obsessed foreign policy people in the US, in China, in many other countries who are single-mindedly focused on the competition. And when anybody starts talking about morality, they become very suspicious and say, this is a trick. They want to do something that reduces mm -hmm. our power. They want us to do something that weakens us. Yeah. And we are not going to fall into that trap. Yeah. So that's we have to calm these people down Mm -hmm. We have to slowly build trust and get away from that hysteria of uh, power maximization, of every little bit counts, which is pervading policy, even domestically, right? That it's a matter of national security that our population is supporting its government. So we have to lie and we have to cheat and we have to manipulate in order to maximize our power, even lie to our own population so that we are stronger in the international competition because we are more popular at home. And this of course is madness, but if some people are mad, then the others also will go mad and will play the same game. So how do we get out of it? We have to find 
uh, you know, two levels on which we have to get out. One is we have to change institutions to build in the public spirit into the institutions themselves. So for example, if we had at the international level, a larger role for courts, then I think that would be positive because courts are harder to manipulate in the interest of national security. They look at the facts, they look at the law, and they decide whether a particular humanitarian intervention is legitimate or illegitimate. And there we have much better hopes. The same is true with the UN Parliamentary Assembly, which we have proposed, Andreas Bummel and myself. And there too, in a parliament, there is only, you know, you have to play by the conventional conversational constraints of parliamentary procedure. You can't just always argue in favor of what benefits your own government or you will lose all credibility. So in a parliament, you can have more of a chance to have the kinds of debates about common good and justice that we need. So that's the procedural level. At the substantive level, we have to find initiatives that are clearly moral in the sense that they clearly advance justice and the common good, but they do not change the distribution of power among the most powerful states. So the clearest example, the most obvious example is we have to eradicate poverty. In Africa now, 80% of the population cannot afford a healthy diet, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. That is an absolute scandal. And it is something that everybody can agree is a scandal. China, the US, everybody can agree to that. So what we need to do is focus the attention of the big powers on that and say, this is something we absolutely have to fix. Hunger has increased by 50% since 2015 when the MDGs expired. And we can, this is just impossible. It's morally absolutely intolerable. And so here we have to find a way to fix that to improve the economic position of the world's poor in a way that everybody can support. It weakens everybody a little bit, but it doesn't change the relative distribution of power among the most powerful states. So if we can devise such a program then and implement such a program, then we can build the trust among the major powers that we need to go forward, right? In the moment, China knows the US only as a military threat. They have uh, troops, uh, you know, fleets are going there near our borders. There are new bases in the Philippines and so on. The Chinese are basically focusing on or seeing the US only in terms of the threat that they're projecting. If the Chinese and the Americans could work together with the Europeans, with India, on improving the food situation in Africa really in a sustainable way, uh, they would begin to build trust and say, look, you know, there are nice people on the other side as well. These people care about poverty. They care about hunger. They care about peace, uh, stopping the arms delivery into Africa that are constantly fueling the civil wars in Africa. So from that experience of collaboration, closer ties can emerge. And then slowly, the obsession with national security will ease and people will be a little bit more tolerant of moves that may have very slight implications for the distribution of power. They will not be so single-mindedly focused on. And then gradually, if we are lucky, war will become less and less of a real possibility, more and more unthinkable. 
and states will resolve their differences, not really even with on the basis of economic power, but largely on the basis of good arguments about what is right and just and what is for the common good of humankind. Yes, sir. Very nice. You but said, that, as you say, the hopes are high and reasonable from the uh, corridors of power to act and improve the situation out there and have a better initiative, which is quite inclusive and equitable. So I would like to just ask you a question in this regard. As India becoming the G20 president and approaching G20 summit has some, some hopes and very high hopes, uh, as the Think Point Engagement Group, which is the intergovernmental interaction forum for G20 this time, uh, which says that we, we, we want to initiate or we wish to initiate and uh, more uh, quite equitable and just and inclusive United Nations uh, reforms, uh, which is based on a multilateral order and uh, which speaks of multipolarity. So how do you see uh, that these big hopes are floating and there are bubbles of it and everyone is speaking about it? So how do you see that getting realized on paper and on, 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 on ground from the uh, people who would who, who need to take the initiatives to realize those reforms on ground? And how do you see that happening or possible or feasibility of it on ground? Yeah, so I see it happening. I, I think, as you say, India's presidency is a great boon for the world. It is really lucky that we have India as president and especially lucky that we have India in a sequence of four presidencies, all of which are from the global south. So we had Indonesia last year, India this year, Brazil is next, and then South Africa. So that gives us a four-year window in which we can make real progress. Now, what's crucial is that India uh, nips in the bud the idea that India is just a power like all the others, is just obsessed with its own power, is trying to rise at the expense of others, become more powerful and take over more of a role in international relations for itself. To be credible, India needs to stay in close touch with the rest of the global South and listen to them and work together with them. And that's why I mentioned these four years, right? Indonesia, Brazil, and South Africa. Those are the kinds of powers with which India needs to collaborate and develop a common program. A program that is driven by values, shareable global values, and not by India's own interest in gaining power at the expense of others. That's, I think, one of the mistakes that China has made. China has uh, presented itself as a champion of the global south, but it has really not been a champion of the global south. It has tried to use that as a way to uh, increase its power, but it has not been willing to really walk the walk, to really uh, take into consideration the needs and interests of other southern countries, at least not to an extent that gave the others the feeling that they were treated as equals and that their concerns and their needs were being paid attention to in Chinese foreign policy. So that's a mistake I think that India must avoid and I think is avoiding to some extent successfully in avoiding, as I said earlier, in the South-South collaboration. So that's India has to sort of come into the picture and say, we are a rising power, but we are not a power like the others that just wants a larger slice of the cake for itself, but we want to challenge the entire way in which international politics is conducted on the basis of naked power. We want to challenge that and we want to remind the world that if we stay with the present paradigm, humanity is not going to survive in the long term without a major catastrophe, a major war in other words. So India is really wants to use 
its power and also its long tradition of peace and its deep culture. India is one of the oldest cultures in the world. It wants to use that to really challenge the way the game is played and to move it onto a level where we talk to each other, we give arguments, we debate questions of justice and the common good, and we make progress on that basis, where even very weak states and people from very weak populations, poor populations, can be heard, can articulate their needs, and can participate in international decision making. Thank you, sir, for uh, such a nice elaboration of the issue. Uh, I would like to ask you another question. Uh, as you as you uh, have done a lot of work uh, in global justice program, and uh, your work is totally inspiring to me in 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 areas of food or uh, security, in areas of justice and equality for all. So, um, as you as uh, John Rawls, a quite eminent thinker, and your advisor said says that veil, veil of ignorance does a lot of injustice. So uh, I would like to ask that China has an approach in its veil of development initiatives, that it goes there as a commercial partner and then certainly that makes a transition towards the security picture and make the gain out of the politics out there. So how do you see that is harming the global south and how the voice of global south being suppressed in quite a certain sense that it creates a lot of burden in terms of those uh, developmental impacts, which needed to have a rather a positive impact on them. So how do you make out of that and how do you draw a picture uh, uh, regarding this? Yeah, so uh, one can divide this into two questions, right? You can say, why is this happening and how can we change it? Now, why it is happening is it's it's understandable, right? China had a terrible, terrible period in the uh, 19th and much of the 20th century. Uh, it, I mean, just look at the horrendous war against the Japanese and how terribly China has been treated. The opium wars in the 19th century, how China has been treated by the Europeans and the US. And so their obsession with power never again is in many ways understandable. So I think that's where it comes from, right? That uh, the leaders of China see as their first responsibility, the responsibility that China will never be weak again. China will never be vulnerable to invasion and to uh, blackmail and oppression by other countries again. So, and that, leads to a certain conservative sentiment that you say that we have to accept the world as it is, as a world, as a jungle where the strongest wins and we just have to try to do as well as we can in this jungle. And of course, what they should be thinking, especially given the fact that they have much more economic strength than military strength, what they should be thinking about is how can we improve the world in such a way that it is no longer such a jungle? How can we break out of that jungle mentality? But in the moment, they are not there yet. And so what you're saying is completely right. They are using every opportunity to increase their power. And that means that they will often do to weak and poor countries exactly what the Europeans and the Americans did to them in earlier times. And they say, we, we have to, we have to, we are in this jungle, we are struggling against a militarily much more powerful opponent. And if we are paying attention to morality, if we treat weak countries nicely, then our morality will be exploited by our adversaries, the US and Europe and so on. Uh, and we will fall back into the inferior position that we had occupied for almost 200 years. 
So that's their thinking. But if we all think like that, then of course the whole world is gonna go down the drain. We have to save humanity by breaking out of the jungle mentality and get everybody to be cooperative and to gradually phase out military force as a source of power, which, as I said at the beginning, is most difficult for the US to accept because it is militarily so very powerful. But here, you know, I see at least the potential that China, maybe not now, but in the next 10, 20 years, can join the kind of uh, effort that India is making to unite the global South and to moralize international relations, right? The, uh, under this, uh, the uh, umbrella of uh, we are all one family, we all have a common future and we have to uh, arrange uh, for that common future. We have to plan for that common future in a way that finds decision-making mechanisms that are not solely focused on national power. So that's my hope. My hope is that both China and also the United States can be one for a project of a very gradual movement in the direction of relying more on international institutions in which arguments decide the uh, way forward rather than institutions where decisions are made on the basis of threat advantage and bargaining power. Yes, uh, as we speak about the uh, reforms in the United Nations, there is Security Council and that all the five permanent members have vetoed. Which, is, uh, which does not sound always a democratic feature in the UN rather an undemocratic one. When you push for the democratization of it, how do you see the future, future of veto? I mean, there can be reforms in the UN, will the veto exist or it will get rid of it and rather an a, a con inclusive uh, picture of an uh, in reformed UN where the, everyone has a say and a decision based on uh, consensus. So, of course, I agree with you substantively that uh, the veto is a bad thing and that also the uh, five countries that now have the veto, that's not a very good choice, right? There's no good reason why France should have a veto and India should not. So uh, that's true. But I think that uh, we need to think about a path of transition that is realistic. and so. This should not be our first target, I think, because as soon as you start questioning the veto power, uh, you are going to have the five countries concerned on high alert, right? They're going to be very upset and very defensive about anybody messing with their veto power. I think that other reforms have to come first, and these other reforms have to build trust and show people how one can arrange international governance in a way that is actually better and more constructive than the present system. And that's why we proposed this UN Parliamentary Assembly. This is something that would be instituted by the General Assembly. So the General Assembly would create such a, a new body with maybe 800 members. Uh, elected from all the different countries that are UN members. And in that UN parliamentary assembly, there would be debates about uh, justice, the common good, about the way of arranging various international treaties, conventions, institutions. And with if this parliamentary assembly is reasonably successful, then it would gradually uh, take over the function of designing the day-to-day -day procedures that govern the world, the just governance procedures, all the things that need international 
deliberation. So trade, international finance, debt, business, ecology, poverty eradication, and so on. All these things would be the subject of hard work within the UNPA. And the UNPA would then uh, get a certain credibility as a moral problem solver. There would still be the Security Council, and the Security Council would still have the unreasonable veto powers of the five permanent members, at least for the next few decades. But more and more of the constructive day-to-day -day work of the UN would take place in a more democratic forum, which is the UNPA. Thank you, sir. It's been quite an engaging discussion, and there is a hope that we become a global citizen, rather a bystander to it. And the high hopes of reforms in the Ukraine, United Nations is a, a kind of a demand of the time, and it happens soon than uh, later. And I, I wish that your, 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 your thoughts reaches uh, the largest number of crowds and uh, then inspires them to think about it and have some policies made uh, around it. So I thank you, sir, again for your time and kind consideration regarding this and your uh, all the uh, inspiring thoughts in this regard. And your work is quite inspiring to me. And I will, I will certainly have a cherished moment having a conversation with you. Very good. Thank you very much to both of you. And I hope this uh, will inspire some thought on the part of our listeners. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, Professor. Yes, yeah, sir. I would like to now I would like to now request Dr. Tripathi, the founder and president uh, of FGS, uh, to, to offer a word of thanks to Honorable Professor. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, dear Professor, we are so privileged and honored to uh, listen to your uh, uh, highly insightful thought on you know, uh, today's uh, UN reforms and the way uh, the entire global order is struggling. Uh, and it's really very interesting to uh, listen to your uh, thought, especially because uh, in, 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 as, as a student of political science, I have been always uh, trying to you know uh, listen time and again and you know to read time and again John Rawls' thought on justice and the justice as fairness. It it literally it reflects in your idea in thought process and the way uh, you put you know that uh, uh, aware uh, the world system there were the global politics is seen as a zero sum game. Nobody talks about <clears throat> this kind of you no. Know, <clears throat> Uh, this kind of cooperation, this kind of uh, <clears throat> a something mechanism that can diffuse the frozen conflict uh, and just because of the uh, realistic uh, mode. But the way you uh, have uh, given your idea that yes, there is a, a solution, there is a mechanism. If we are uh, really honest uh, to give uh, to give the uh, to give the voice for the uh, poor people, to give the voice for the uh, uh, weaker nations. And if you are really concerned about the you know, uh, uh, peace and uh, uh, humanity, uh, because this kind of cornerstone that has been laid down after Second World War, and soon after be engaged in Cold War, and soon after be engaged. So the dilemma you have cleared, the dilemma that no, the world is always about the power ridden politics. The world is always the geopolitics, but the way you have you know, given your insights, and no, if we are really concerned about the peace and world order, so even it is interest for the uh, hegemonic power of countries like uh, US and China and emerging countries like India, if India is really you know, willing to uh, establish its voice as a global south, uh, we should come out from this framework as a rising power, however, it is representing the global south. So th thanks so much, sir. Your idea will illuminate us in future. And I hope that uh, FGS will keep on inviting you and uh, your insights will be very, very you know, uh, relevant for India's policymakers 
and those who are involved in this uh, global politics, they must know, they must listen to your thoughts. Thank you so much, sir, for your coming and for your Thank you, Nandini, for your moderation. Thank you, sir.